Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, so thank you, Rachel, for just uh, introducing me. And thank you, Jenny Bo, for having me today to share on the topic of mental resilience in children, as well as on stress. I think this is a really interesting topic to discuss, especially now during COVID times. I think that the last few years, there have been so many changes in the education system in Singapore. For example, the new PSLE system, which has made many parents worry, many children worry as well. Um, COVID measures always changing. Um, I think now don't really see so many schools closing for full, but I think also you see about if a class has too many COVID cases, maybe the class will be going for HBL quite quickly. These are all disruptions to the school schedule, teaching schedule, as well as to family and child schedule. We can also create stress, right? I think today we're here to discuss how can we help the child? How can we first understand the child? Understand your child, your children, as well as to understand what factors can we address together to really help the child to overcome and to improve their mental resilience. So I think today what we touch on first is really your child. We also discuss a bit about the current stages of development. So a bit of theory, psychological for us to understand a bit more about how, mm, what they're going through right now, what can we expect and how can we improve and help our children in the current stage of development. Um, we also dis will discuss what is stress, uh, sources of stress, mental health in children, mental resilience in children, as well as helping your child to become more mentally resilient. So to me, I actually discussed and I designed this uh, flow of slides because I think it helps us to, first of all, understand the theory and we end off with the practical to see how we can actually help to improve our child's mental resilience. So of course, you're here at this webinar, I suppose your child's going to be in primary school, which means the age range is about 7 to 12 years old in Singapore. That means from primary 1 to primary 6. And I think you can agree with me that during this age range, a wide range of changes in their hobbies, development, as well as their academic demands. I think in primary 1 and primary 2, I think um, since 2019, there were no weighted assessments for primary 1 primary 2, so no exams really. I think recent times, I think this has kind of been extended a bit to the primary 3, 4, 5 as well. There's no more midterm exams. Right. So I think for better or for worse, I think some parents are actually concerned that there's no need to make sense. So how do you know how our child is doing? We don't want the child to be so stressed at the end of the year. But some parents are also celebrating that, hey, without this, we can also at least have more time to spend the child, um, not always revising for exams, and even focusing a bit on learning. So I think there are really two sides of the coin here. But definitely there are a lot of changes recently which have confused parents, and I think also maybe have worried the school system as well as the family systems. Of course, during the age range, so we see um, normal um, scheduling to be schooling hours, CCAs, as well as even enrichment classes like Genie Book or even other um, enrichment camps. Hopefully, there's also family time. And of course, one thing to stress really for the child at this age is to have individual play time. I think a lot of times parents do misunderstand that um, in this very stressful stage, primary school especially, um, we should always prepare and prepare and prepare. Yet, I also always stress that play is important, not just to relax not just to be stressed, but also to help the child learn new skills. In fact, play has been shown to be so important in a child's development that there's a mental resilience is one of the key facets here. So for me, I kind of split this um, presentation to three big key influences, the biological, the psychological, as well as the social. Okay? I think this helps us to kind of like not see, oh, every child is different. But in fact, we have a few key frameworks to think of how they are different. And in these differences, these three categories, how can we address the differences one by one? Okay, so it's all saying, oh, my, child are diff my children are different, my, my elder daughter is so different from my younger son, and so on and so forth. I, I'm sure they're all different, as every child will be different. But in having these categories, it helps us to hopefully think a bit deeper. And I hope parents can also think a bit with me on how to adapt, change, and to support the child. So it's a biological, um, of course, everyone is different in terms of genetics. Although every child is going to have 50% of your genes from each parent, the way it's split and expressed is really quite different. So this can come in terms of some may also have mental conditions or even medical conditions, which may also affect the child. So for someone, someone with eczema or sinus or even um, allergies, not being able to sleep well at night will also affect how the child develops resilience, how the child will also perform in school. So definitely, I think biological is one to really focus on as well. Next is, of course, psychological. And by that, I mean like something like temperament. Temperament is what we call like personality for um, since you were born. Traditionally, um, personality is one that is kind of more or less formed around the age of 18. But I think that temperament is one like, it's kind of the personality that you're born with. And because you're born with this personality, 
the way you respond, the way you see the world will be quite different. And that also influences how parents will actually respond to you. For example, if a child is born very anxious, always very scared, parents will tend to be a lot more overprotective and they may come in to really um, um, help a child maybe a bit too quickly because of their past experiences. Of course, um, they also have, children also have thinking styles, the way they think about themselves and the world. And of course, their own expectations, which also involve family, teacher, friends, and their own expectations. Last, of course, is social. This involves relationship with friends, teachers, family, um, parenting styles. I think all in all, what I'm really trying to say here is that the amount of the social world that a kid is in will determine the amount of social support that the child will actually perceive to have. So the word I use is perceive, which means that sometimes, even though parents tell me, you know what, we all support the child, we all support my son, you know, we all support, we all love him very much. But sometimes when I speak to the son directly, he feels that um, I, I, I cannot share this with daddy, mommy. You know, I know they love me, but I just don't feel comfortable sharing. So therefore, what you provide may not be exactly what the child would perceive. And why is that so? It's not always that the parents are doing something wrong. It also involves what you're doing, whether it's a good fit with the child's temperament and their thinking styles. So some um, stages of development, during this age of 7 to 12, in terms of cognitive stages, which is the academic development, we use John Piaget's model, where they are now in a concrete operational stage. Okay, This means that during this stage, uh, children begin to think very logically about concrete events. The key word here is really concrete, which means that what you see is what you get. All right. So for example, here is that they understand concepts like conservation, like how uh, like you can see, right, amount of liquid in a short white cup is equal to that in the tall skinny glass. Their thinking in this stage becomes a lot more logical, organized. So parents can get very encouraged. Oh, my child is growing up. My child is learning very fast. But let's not forget, they are still very concrete. So therefore, you, some parents say things like, you know, you're starting very hard. You can get a good job in the future. You can have a good lifestyle. Um, I think it's very hard for the child to understand. That involves a lot more abstract thinking, maybe a lot more in secondary school. But concrete would mean like, hey, you know, like um, what you do today, I praise you for it right now. That's something that's very, very relevant and very helpful to children. So this stage also, children begin to use inductive logic. This really means that they can reason from specific information to a general principle. So they start to generalize skills across different domains. For example, at home, my mom praised me for working hard. You know, and they may look for the same type of um, reinforcement in different settings as well. So we start to really generalize this. I think it's really important to know because therefore it means that what we do at home, what they do by themselves and what happens in school are actually going to be all interrelated. Of course, the other stage I want to talk about today is also a bit on psychosocial stages, which is by Eric Erickson. So again, some people do ask me, um, Gifford, why do you share about um, these psychological and social stages? Are they completely different from the PIG stages, which is very much to do with their academic and their cognitive abilities. I will say actually they are kind of interrelated. Okay, let, me, let me address why. In this stage, um, they go through this phase called industry versus inferiority, which really means that through social interactions with peers, with adults, and with their own friends, children begin to develop a sense of pride in their own accomplishments and their abilities. So I think the key word here is really they begin to develop. So it's emerging. Pride, which is what we call confidence, as well as in their accomplishments and abilities, which really means that they have to take some responsibility and accountability for their own successes. So if parents always come in to support, scared that maybe the child is going to be under too much distress, the child may not even perceive this as their own abilities, and, that's them, and therefore this will fail. Children in this stage also need to cope with new social and academic demands. This really means that what they do, how they perform, how they try in school, will actually also lead to their resilience. For well, some people will feel that, oh, grades are grades, no resilience is resilience. Actually, I think they are one large concept together. For example, if a child is able to do well in school, they will get more and more um, confident. They will feel more and more ready to learn new challenges, to ask more and more questions, and that will in turn, of course, aid their learning. So it's really a, I call it a very positive cycle. Of course, in this stage, success leads to a sense of competence, while failure will actually lead to feelings of inferiority. Therefore, it means that success in school, and I don't really mean by grades, would really mean a lot to a child's mental resilience. So, of course, a very popular question, what is stress? A lot of parents do feel that stress means like exams, um, 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 friendship problems, but really, 
Stress is a person's physical and emotional response to the demands or pressures of daily life. So it really means that it's not only just what adversity they face, but how a child is able to respond. All right. So I think over here, I also put a point here that says it's not just the demands placed on us, but also our ability to meet the stress. So look at the picture over here. I kind of like use this um, nice um, traffic light analogy here, right? Where this is what we call the yerkes dodson um, stress performance curve, where we can see that in the middle range, the optimal range is where we want a child to kind of be like. So you use a scale of say zero to 10 in terms of stress, um, that range will be about maybe zero or um, four to six out of 10. So in this range, the child's going to be quite focused, um, motivated, and the performance will be the best. Of course, every child will be really different, right? So this means that the best will differ from child to child, but definitely in terms of their own abilities, this way we can get them to be optimized, for them to be motivated, as well as to be um, sufficiently challenged. Because on the left side, say for example, if it's not stressed, you know, like very, very slack, very lazy, they become very inattentive and not motivated. It is on the left side of the screen. But of course, again, if they are too stressed, so some parents, they do give a lot of pressure on children. Too stressed, they will feel very distracted. They will feel very overloaded and overwhelmed. And once again, I suppose if you are too, you are too unmotivated, you don't feel any sense of urgency, parent's job is to alert the child to move in the optimal range. And of course, if the child is in the overwhelmed range already, we're going to help the child to calm down to be in the, again, the optimal range. So once again, look at this picture, I will always guide parents to the optimal range. But of course, you realize that the child is not always going to stay in the optimal range the whole time. Because the whole year, the child will move from the left to the right, from zero to maybe um, eight to nine out of 10. So it's so parents also understand the child's psychology, the child's warning distress signs, and to see when we can actually help the child to really increase the stress levels or to decrease the stress levels. Again, at this age, realize that children, while they are young, they're emerging and they're learning, um, they're not going to be so able to always know what to do. So parents will say, hey, you know, I think you know what to do, right? Um, I think it's not so helpful because for one, um, they may not know what to do. It can depend on the age of the child. Number two, they may feel that the support that they get from parents is not enough. So of course, it's on stress. There are also different stresses here. There's acute stress, which is like once in a while. There's episodic stress, for example, like, Every, um, for some point, exams, right? Let's say for end of year exams, it's an like episode, you know, that you always happen during this period of time. And of course, chronic stress, which can be very overwhelming for children. For example, family stress, medical conditions, or even financial concerns. So I think for each type of stress, we want to make sure we can help the child to meet the stress accordingly. So what are some signs of being too distressed? So obviously, I mean in the right side, you know, maybe for example, seven to 10 out of 10 level of stress. You see the child in terms of emotions, having more and more mood swings, acting out tantrums, even we call it regression of skills like big wetting, having low anxious moods. You see the child being more withdrawn, even spending more time alone. Okay, of course, every child is a bit different. So some children may be just more, um, they like to have more alone time. They like to have a lot more, um, uh, they feel more anxious by personality. But what I really mean here is there's a change, okay? But now the child is a lot more distressed and a lot more um, withdrawn than usual. Um, of course, there could also be changes in their routines. Thing to look out for would be to change in sleep routines, nightmares, and even changes in appetite. Some children do complain of physical effects like stomach aches, headaches, and so on and so forth, which may also result in a bit of school refusal sometimes. And of course, um, in school, what we see is a lot of difficulties concentrating if they're too distressed or even a drop in academic performance. I think these are just some, these are not exhaustive. Um, just some signs in terms of what we can observe in children who are actually quite distressed. Okay. I think if parents do observe this for a period of time, I am a period of time, I mean, see, everyone goes through these distress periods almost every day, right? And every child actually responds to these distresses. Um, I would say in their own ways, some resolve by themselves and don't need parents to really address. Some may need some support. But I would say if this science persists, for example, for a period of about two weeks in a row, I think it's something for parents to monitor, okay? And to get a bit more information from the child or from teachers or from others who know. So what is promoting positive mental health in children? Okay, I think, uh, again, a very 
important topic, especially in these COVID times where things have always been changing. First of all, I must stress that mental health doesn't only mean the absence of mental disorder. So I'm a clinical psychologist. I see a lot of mental disorders. And I always stress to all the parents I see that doesn't mean that um, they have no mental disorders, means they are all okay. Mental health really means reaching developmental and emotional milestones, learning healthy social skills and how to cope when there are problems. So you can see it's a lot more of a behavioral outcomes they can see, all right? And what are these developmental and emotional milestones? I think academically, I think schools do quite a good job in the assessments of the child and teachers do give quite timely feedback too. Um, so I always stress that if there's, there are feedback that's quite quick and easy and even involves parents, that'd be really helpful. I think maybe Rachel will share a bit more about this in Ginny Books um, I'll put out a bit later on. But I think in terms of other milestones, in terms of emotional milestones, you want to see the child grow better, to ask questions, to also um, be a bit more independent. Okay? And of course, mentally healthy children have a positive quality of life. They can function well at home, in school, and in their communities. So I think one way to really explain what resilience is about, right, is to imagine a plane encountering turbulence mid-flight. The turbulence of this poor weather, right, will represent the adversity, the stress that a child is going through. Of course, different planes respond to poor weather in different, different weather conditions in different ways. In the same way, different children will respond to the same adversity in different ways. So, I mean, some of us may have children, more than one child at home. It doesn't mean that because I taught this before, they are on the same family, um, they should experience and they should respond to the same stress in the same way. I think that's a very... Uh, uh, wrong way to look at things. Because this means that parents will assume, this means that parents will not be as attentive, and this also means that for the children who need help, they may not, number one, they may not know they need help, number two, they may not dare to seek help. And obviously, if the child doesn't seek help, it's very difficult for parents to understand. It's like playing mind games with a child, and I think that's not very helpful. So the ability of the plane to get through the poor weather and reach its destination depends largely on the pilot, which is really the child. The co-pilot, which is the child's family, friends, teachers, and health professionals. The type of plane, which is like the child's individual characteristics. Does I mention the biological, the psychological, and the social factors that we discussed there? Which is age, temperament, and even the current academic or social ability. The equipment available, which is like the resources that we have, for example, in terms of um, um, tuitions, enrichment classes, and even um, school settings, all right? And of course, last but not least, how severe and how difficult the weather, the adversity is. So again, once again, by doing this, I hope to split up instead of just saying, oh, it's just the child must manage the stress, right? It's also looking at what the child already has and can we improve some of his skills to address the stress? Again, I do add that sometimes parents do over-identify a little bit the child. Some parents will tell me that, oh, I know my, I know my, I know my son very well. You know, he looks like me. Um, he's just exactly like me when I was younger. Hence, I know what he's going through. And this is, I think, a bit dangerous sometimes because the fact is that your child will be different. Um, at least 50% of your DNA, living in a very different time right now, our times are always changing. I mean, like right now, I'm not doing a talk in a public forum setting. I'm doing a webinar. It really shows how different things are from now to last time. We cannot just assume that, oh, because it's like me, so I think this will work. I think it's always good to ask the child and to involve the child, no matter how young they are, in their own uh, management, okay? And again, I will add that the first point I put here is that the pilot is the child. Sometimes parents do think that they are the pilots, you know, and they, um, I suppose in this way, they kind of like um, remove the opportunity for the child to try to address the stress and to overcome it. So while the stress may be over, parents, um, they have a sigh of relief, the child has a sigh of relief, but I think in this case, no one really learns. Because parents are just managing primary school problems. The child just finished the problem, but there's no learning. And that's only not what resilience is all about. So over here, right, I'm going to share with you guys a framework on how to really understand resilience. And again, of course, to promote resilience. So we have four boxes here. The first one is ready to build, strengthen, and promote supportive relationships. Next, we want to focus on autonomy and responsibility. Next, of course, to focus on managing emotions, which are really important. And last but not least, also to create opportunities for personal challenges. 
Okay. Maybe I'll explain each one, each one of them to you guys. Again, I'll add it because everyone is different. So it's not very fair for me to say, oh, this is all resilience for everybody. I think it's for every parent to kind of like, maybe use the slides to think a bit about what you can take home. Um, and again, to also um, think how you can use this for each of your children. Again, it's not very fair to say, oh, this can be for my whole family. I'll say even for the whole family, certain things may be a bit different for each child. So I'd like to encourage everyone to think of each child a bit uh, differentially, which I think will be a lot more helpful in terms of coming up with plans to support children. Okay, I'd love to hear you guys later on in the Q&A on how to really, or what you guys have in mind. And again, I hope to again add value to what you guys may ask me later on. So the first point I have here is really to build, strengthen and promote supportive relationships. I think we've heard from me so far that this support is really important. Some parents do ask me, hey, but um, Gifford, um, the child is so resilient, right? Do they need support? Am I hampering the child's resilience and independence by supporting the child? So I'll add a last point here, right? Really important that strong relationships are the foundation of a child's resilience. Okay, so I'll say you are not doing that. But I suppose how you do it is the important factor here, not whether the child feels supported or not. Some parents do say, oh, if too supported, then is it too, too lazy, too relaxed? You know, like everything can ask mommy to do it. Lah. That's why I will not, um, a child will not grow. Again, that's where we'll discuss a bit more here today. So first of all, these relationships are not just with adults, but also with their peers. I think at home, parents can control this, but I'll say with peers also is quite important. This way, I think in school, um, teachers do quite a good job in terms of um, spreading the kids to different project groups. Um, I think the table leaders, they are given uh, opportunities to discuss with their peers as well. But also, at, these peers may also include like family members, um, like cousins, sisters, brothers, and so on and so forth. I think it's so important for family to spend quality time with your child. So I think that a lot of parents, I think in this day and age, they work from home. So they are with the child, but they're not really very quality. This doesn't mean that parents don't want, but because they're so tired at the end of the day, through Zoom calls or webinars like this, that they find that they cannot perform to the best of their abilities to be with the child. So I suppose in quality time, it doesn't have to be very long. You know, I think that we're looking at something that's maybe 15 to 20 minutes, okay? And once again, um, if it's with your child, it means that's something that your child must enjoy. So actually, I would like to ask your child, hey, what would you like to do with me today? Is it reading a book? Is it talking about a game? Is it sharing me what's happening in school? So when the child suggests something, it could even be something as simple as a walk. For me, as a, as a clinical psychologist, I try to go away from the games, okay? Or at least I know sometimes children may love to play games as well, especially in this day and age, but I would say not every time. Is that all right? Because I think if you always use games, because games are one way to really um, engage your child. So sometimes the games can be more quality than the parents' quality time. And that kind of takes away from the idea of supportive, uh, supportive relationships. Of course, um, I like to so encourage parents to support your child to build relationships with other adults. I think as parents, we are often very, um, we know what to do, you know? We have the best interest at heart for our children. I'm talking about like, for example, um, extended family, other adults, even with teachers. Okay, I think these are, again, teaching your child new ways to build relationships. And of course, to help your child to develop social skills and friendships with peers. This also help your child to develop empathy and perspective taking. Once again, this helps your child a lot with the knowing the social environment a lot better. This will also in turn make them feel a lot more confident in terms of their academic learning and their individual autonomy. And I said earlier, these strong relationships with you, with peers, with siblings, with extended family members, with other adults, are really the foundations of a child's resilience. Next, of course, on autonomy and responsibility. You have to talk to your children about problem solving. So I think this is a bit different from telling your child what to do, how to solve problems. I think especially in the academic setting, this is a lot to do with um, uh, a lot of direct instruction. So when we talk about this, I don't mean direct instruction. I mean involving your child to come up with some solutions for themselves. Again, like I said, this age range from 7 to 12, so it's a very big age range in terms of their ability, their maturity, their social abilities, as well as their, their resilience, right? So that's quite expected. So when I say talk to your child about problem solving, I really mean um, involving your child a bit about, hey, you know, um, you're not doing so well in this one. What do you think you can do to help? I ask the child a bit. Normally, children will be like, uh, they don't know. 
how, I often ask children to think, hey, what did you do last week then that helped you a bit with this? Remember at this stage, there are this inductive reasoning, which means they're trying to really kind of generalize skills. Oh, you know, um, maybe yesterday at, um, I, at my berries class, you know, I did this, um, I practiced a few times with my berries and I got the words. Oh, then can you do that for your Chinese spelling as well? So this way, you realize that because they come with the solutions, they come with the ideas, parents can have to paraphrase and make it be easier for them. And once again, when, it's, when it works, they view it as their own success, their own accomplishments. Is it okay? And of course, for parents to also praise them for this. This also means that we need to allow your child to make certain decisions. Like for example, hey, you know, this is a Barry's class. Uh, you think it works? Why don't you try it today? Okay? Even if you know, hey, it may not work so well. All right? This goes to our third point, right? Because children are growing, they are beginning to learn pride in their own accomplishments. We have to expect that they will have many, 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 and repeated same failures and mistakes. Okay? If so, I'm not asking for parents to really, um, I suppose, be resilient as well, you know? It's not easy for parents to see the mistakes that you know are coming. Because we're more mature, we have so much more experience, we want to step in to help a child. Um, but recognize that in this, failure is a part of success. It means that the more they fail, and the more, uh, because they're so concrete, right? Failure is how they learn. So you tell me, you know what? You did it before, right? I know you do it wrongly. Uh, I suppose parents learn. The child may not learn until they fail themselves. Okay? Of course, I also add um, to provide opportunities for free play. Like I said earlier, playing free associative time or even quite imaginative or creative play. It's a time for the child to really use all those logic they learn in school and to replay it for themselves. So it's how they rehearse and how they reinforce these values and principles. So, not, so I mean, we may see a child just lying down and just playing whether it's Pokemon or it's Beyblades or other toys that they have. I would say that while they're doing so, they're not only playing, while it's fun for them, in their brain, they're rehearsing certain things. So at this, especially at this age, it's really important for them to grow. So therefore, it, needs, um, it means that being bored is not always bad. Some parents will tell me that, hey, your child is always very bored, doing nothing, not learning. I would say learning doesn't always come from a computer screen, a textbook, or even from exercise assessment books. Learning can also come from play. Because when they are playing and they're being bored, they actually rehearse all this in their, in their minds. So once again, we go back to the previous stages we discussed earlier. Okay? And of course, it helps to also be a role model for your child. Lah, all right? So it means that sometimes when you solve problems, it's also good to share with your child how you solve problems. It may involve your child in some, it may not involve your child in everything. It helps for you to kind of share a bit more. Your child says, oh, this is how you arrive at this conclusion. And of course, for children, of course, at different ages, please make it simple and easy for them to understand. Next, of course, the third one is to really to manage emotions. I always do encourage parents to help to speak to their children about feelings. I think especially in Asia, feelings are a bit more, um, a bit more taboo than say in the Western societies. But I think in Singapore, we have reached a stage where parents are actually quite educated. In fact, schools are doing a lot of this uh, emotion management and teaching in class. I think for parents, often they are quite um, comfortable with a child who's sad and maybe even scared. But I think especially in Asia, maybe, you know, parents and maybe especially fathers are very uncomfortable with a child's anger. So I would say that to me, emotions are what we call a compass, you know. Every emotion technically teaches us what we are thinking, what we need for right now. For example, if I'm sad, means maybe I lost something. Then, no, I need some comfort. So again, that sadness informs me that I need comfort. So parents can teach children, oh, you know, look, look, look sad, what's happening? The child's sharing a bit, and then the parents sighing the child or comfort the child. He addresses the very need the child wants and makes them feel a lot more confident about knowing the emotion. And of course, what I need to manage the emotion is some comfort. For example, if a child is scared, it means that there's a threat, danger. Oh no, I'm scared they didn't scold me. I'm scared the teacher will scold me. I'm scared the class will laugh at me. Again, so it's very sad. The emotions comes thoughts, okay? And again, it's easier for the parents to, once you know the feelings, to discuss that together with the child on how to manage this, okay? You're sharing your own experiences or even sharing, you know what? I'll speak to the teacher for you about this tomorrow. Of course, um, next is anger, like I said earlier. A lot of times, um, because if your anger is disrespect, you know, it's wrong, it's rude, it is um, um, wrong to hit out 
well, I understand where parents are coming from. Some is so helpful when the child is a bit calmer. I think the, the, the peak or the height of the anger, it can be very hard to really um, restrain the child. So often I let the child have a bit more space to discuss that and then later on, still talk a little bit about the anger. Because to me, sometimes anger is a, in terms of psychology, even clinical psychology, even with children, um, anger is a very convenient way for a child to feel a lot stronger. So for example, if a child is very scared, it, the feeling is very internalizing, it's very defeatist, it's very weak. And I think no child, boy or girl, likes this opinion. So sometimes when they're very scared, they actually get very angry. So if parents respond to the anger directly only and just leave it as that, stop it. The child's needs are not met. Then they realize, no, I shouldn't be feeling this way anymore. And once they stop feeling this way, parents actually have no other ways to really manage anymore. It's like, it's like to just stop all these feelings. All right? So I do always encourage children to talk about feelings, even the anger, but maybe when they're not so angry later. Um, I also always teach parents to really acknowledge when a child is distressed. Okay? Because remember, we talked about just now the, the traffic light rule. Um, in the two distress, again, two distress can be overwhelmed, like, like eight to 10 out of 10 distress. It can also be from zero to two or zero to three levels of distress. Okay? So again, in this way, once we know about it, because of the child using numbers, I think most primary school kids can use zero to 10 for sure. All right? And I think um, that way you can help the child to whether you should dial up or dial down the distress. I also often teach parents to use open-ended questions with your child. Some parents will tell me about very much fun and all because they always say they don't know. But just because they don't know doesn't mean that we don't teach. Lah. All right? Because you're trying to create and teach these sort of principles for them. Okay? And I often ask parents to use like, questions like, what was the best thing about today? What was the toughest thing about today? I rarely use more like judgmental or evaluative terms like, what do you do well today? Uh, what do you do today that they just call you for? You know, so I try to ask more judgmental and close-ended questions. But this will actually encourage the child to share a bit more. It sounds like you're actually interested in the child, but you're still teaching a child to really reflect what they enjoy and what they struggle with. In this case, like you can, parents are, again, with more information, always easier to think of what you can praise the child more for. I also always discuss with parents about in terms of emotions to talk to your child about preparing for events. Okay, I think for this example, um, whether it's um, end of year exams, we often talk about what is we expected. I think um, in more recent times, I think the COVID-19 vaccinations, right, have opened up for our children on this age range. And I think that it's always good to talk to a child about preparing for this. So again, instead of like, oh no, I don't want, I heard it's very painful. I want to walk, walk the child through um, each stage, what to expect and what they can do. And of course, I think uh, also to help the child to realize that tough times are part of life. So when I say this, right, I really don't mean my parents say, you know what, uh, life is tough, you know, now you study very easy already, okay? When you grow older like me, it's very difficult. So I don't mean this, because once again, this is very abstract. And children at this age, they cannot understand this. Okay? So what I really mean is, some daddy, mommy, after work, they're tired, they're hungry, they are not in a good mood too. So it's okay to share with a child, hey, you know, I'm actually very tired today. Today I got scolded by my boss. Or I'm very stressed, you know, tomorrow I have to do a presentation and I need to uh, change a lot more things. So I'm so quite tired today. So using your own experience, it helps the child to also understand a lot more about, oh, it's not only me going through distress, not only me feeling scared, not only me feeling angry. Daddy mommy so feel angry. Okay, and this is how they deal with it. And because most children, since they were young, they will, especially at this age group, they will really look at parents as role models, as examples, like templates of what to do. Therefore, when you are open with your own feelings, you're showing them that you also struggle, and this is how you cope with your struggle. Of course, you use um, primary school language to help them to understand. It makes them feel a lot more that they're not alone. They don't feel weird. And once again, it encourages them to um, take a more active approach towards understanding this negative feelings. But I also will add that this is not only about negative feelings. So managing emotions doesn't always mean managing negative emotions. Even the positive ones, these points apply to as well. Whether it's happy or surprised, it is um, excited, or is just overjoyed or feel very proud of yourself for winning a race or being praised by teacher. These are also things that we want to encourage your child to talk about. So again, don't misunderstand that. Resilience only means negative feelings, okay? Because once again, having a good range of emotions, education, practice, and even reflection seen from parents as well will help your child to really realize that emotions are not all bad.
And I think the last bracket I have here is we want to create opportunities for personal challenges. So I always ask teach, um, parents to teach your child to have a go, to give it a shot, try yourself like, a bit of like, self-learning. And of course, we know that they may make mistakes, they may get a bit hurt, they may get a bit dirty. I often always encourage parents that this is actually part of their learning. They are concrete, they may get a bit dirty, sweaty, tired, and even frustrated to really understand and learn. And it's not very fair for parents in their bid and their love for children to give the easiest and most efficient way out. Because once again, even if they finish and they learn the, for some academic material, they, get, they do well in school, they feel proud. They may not feel proud of themselves. And they feel proud that parents are helping them so much. And I think while I understand in this age group, um, it's not very easy for them to differentiate this. I like it to be almost like 50-50. They know I, um, daddy and mommy are always loving me and supporting me. They give me resources when I need to. I can go there for help, but I can also try it myself first. So I want this like growing effect. But this leads very well into the next stage. I suppose it's uh, beyond the scope of today's webinar. But the next stage in teenagehood, where they learn to manage with their new difficulties, the next stage of life. Of course, you encourage your child to experience some everyday difficulties. So once again, like we said earlier, uh, you cannot teach resilience uh, without challenges and difficulties. The child must fall down. They can learn to get back up. The child is always walking and never fall down, always supported, having perfect support. Um, it's really very hard for them to learn resilience. So I suppose resilience is a double-edged sword, right? You must struggle, but you must grow from the struggle. That's what I always tell parents. I think most parents who see me hear the word grow, they feel quite comforted. That okay, you know, I am. I think my child goes through some distress, but I suppose in this way it is their growth, their journey. And to be fair, most of the kids that I see in my clinic as well, they also share me the same thing, you know. And when they overcome it, they are so proud, you know. I talk about like and talking about like things like, for example, um, bullying in school. Say for example, even um, um, doing badly for things here, um, failing a little bit criticized in class for being too hyperactive and talking, um, not being liked by a classmate, um, and things like that, right? Or even losing wallet, uh, all, all that stuff in school. It happens a lot more in primary school. I think they need to experience some of these difficulties too. And for the parents to understand, to listen, and to teach them what you can do. So like I said, once we teach them, the, give them a chance to go through some difficulties, still must help them to overcome it in a more positive way. Okay? Of course, um, very important to encourage your child to build independence. And of course, if they do do that, I mean, I, I'm this age group talking about small things like packing your bag to yourself, uh, at home, go home, something your child to do homework for themselves. Parents, please be quick to really praise them for it. Why? Because again, they're in this very concrete stage, they need reinforcements rather quickly and rather visibly. It cannot be like, I'll praise them later. Uh, again, once it's out of the picture, outside, out of mind. Okay, that's why. If you say, oh, it's very good. Well, you remember the homework, huh? Very good, very good. This quick praise means a lot to your child. And the effects are spread across different domains, remember? So I will encourage parents to often pick up on these things and opportunities for praise. So just as you create opportunities for personal challenge, I don't mean to just leave them in the lurch, but in these challenges, they will respond. In this response, there are chances for us as parents to praise. Okay, and of course, this is how they build independence. They realize that they are reinforced when they are independent. When they do certain things, they initiate certain things, they have a goal. They are reinforced by parents who praise them, who take notice. All right. And once again, of course, for those with um, children, not just one child, I think for those with one child, parents are a lot more attentive because it's like a milestone. But for those who maybe have older children, they tend to think, oh, uh, yeah, la, it's normal at this age la, to do this, you know. But you can recognize that every child is different. So this means that. Every child will respond to the praise in their own way. So just because Tetsia can do it very well doesn't mean that, oh, I think Titi can also do it. The praise, the building of this independence and the opportunities will also mean a lot to the younger siblings. And of course, to talk to your child about self-talk. This is a bit difficult for parents sometimes because this self-talk is internalizing the head. So parents cannot see, they cannot tell what the child is going through, what's going through the mind. I think I'll add that sometimes you can see some signs like, there was some um, slides I shared earlier about distress. So you know, if a child is like withdrawing, vomiting, having headaches, 
um, 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 feeling very low, very anxious, change in behaviors or routines, we know that this means that there's some negative stuff going on. They're experiencing some negative emotions. And we know with negative emotions, what's going to correspond is really some negative self-talk. Right? So often if this happens, your parents can observe the signs in the children. I'll ask them to really talk to the children about the emotions and ask, hey, like, what are you thinking? You know, like, like um, what do you think they think about you? What do you think, or how, what is troubling you? So something a bit open-ended. So different from, is it because they don't like you? Uh, that's why you like, so I'll not leave all these leading questions. Because then the, the kid learns, wow, I never even say that about mommy think that you don't like me. That means, wow, mommy thinks very badly on me as well. So often I let the kid say a bit more first. Again, I, at the start, I think kids will be a bit more reluctant to do this. This involves a lot of skills for them to share their self-talk. At this age, once again, they may not be aware that they have this self-talk. So parents will say and coach them in small ways. Okay? For example, if say a kid is like left out of a play group or maybe um push out of a friendship group or maybe argue with a friend over a, maybe a gun game or a fight, you know, child may think, hey, they don't like me. I'm weird, I'm lousy, I'm slow at running, something like that, you know. And again, I often ask parents to remind them of times when they have played happily with others too. Why? Because I like to use concrete and past successes. There may be something you've done before. You know, achieved before, it comes across as a well positive image. So, rest, oh yeah, actually, they don't, they don't, they don't think I'm weird. I, uh, I, I play them most of the time. But today, I'm not in the group. Maybe I'll try again tomorrow. This when parents you can teach your child to have a go and to coach them a bit. But hey, maybe you know, like, um, what can you do to make friends again? So parents can coach a little bit, but let the child go in as opposed to. The parents bring the kids together and say, oh, y'all be friends, huh? y'all be friends, huh? friends play together. So again, I'll leave it as that for a while. So you can give your child, your child a chance to have these opportunities. Okay. So a sign of a resident child would, if you do all this, right? I'm not saying it's a template or a sure fire way, but definitely when a child starts to begin to grow in their resilience, they will demonstrate a much more genuine interest in school. For school will no longer be only about spelling and assessments and teachers and schooling, but also a chance to build supportive relationships, friendships even with teachers, managing problems, helping friends solve problems as well. So it's like schools are a very stimulating place. It's not just about homework. Again, they will solve problems effectively. Effectively doesn't mean perfect. It means that they are growing and they have much more tempted to try across, like I said, different domains. For example, say for example at home, say a uh, mommy scold a child, and then uh, a child knows the mommy is very angry. The child like, first of all, tell mommy I'm sorry, mommy. That mommy gives the child a hug. Say you know it's okay. You know learn, learn from this. So in, in school, for example, if say um there's a fight in class and the child makes a mistake, and like uh, maybe hits another child, this child also will now have the guts and the experience to say and try to say sorry to the friend. So that's how it generalizes. And that's also a way to solve problems sometimes, especially emotional and social ones. Of course, um, a more resilient child would be more assertive. Assertive doesn't mean aggressive. It means that uh, they will share their point of view. They'll be more likely to stand their ground and they will even show initiative. They will be more empathic towards others. Because once again, once you kind of throw in confidence in yourself and how things are working, you feel more prepared, more equipped to also care and protect others. They become more responsible and trustworthy. They learn to set and attain more realistic goals. Because now they know what I can achieve, how I grow. A lot more aware of the emotions and what could be difficult for them because of what parents have modeled for them. They now are more aware of how to grow. And for some so it's not the same thing like, I want to always call 10 out of 10 for spelling. They say, I want to do my best. I know my best maybe is about, at least usually about um, 8 out of 10 you No, know, is my target. I hope to score 10 out of 10, but uh, I know it's called 8 out of 10. So something like that, it helps your child to gain. Um, set more realistic goals. Of course, children will also act more, independent, more independently and maintain a sense of purpose and a more positive outlook on life. How do we get this positive outlook on life? It means that they are able to solve problems. So these are all points that are phrased differently but really um, interrelated with each other. People have usually a very pessimistic, uh, pessimistic outlook on life. Even children, if they feel helpless. Helpless means that I don't know what to do or no one can help me, or very depressive self-talk. So when parents understand, they help a little bit, and the child try, fail, never mind, come back, you try again, you have support all the time. The child feel a lot more 
ready to keep trying, keep growing, and of course, the outlook will be a lot more positive. Of course, the last point is to ask for support when needed. Like I said earlier, a lot of parents do get concerned. Oh no, I always support a child. No, then you say, I thought you said don't support the child. I'll say, um, I think you want the child to always understand that support is always there. We love you, or we will support you in whichever way you need. But for now, I think you've tried this before. You have done and done very well for this before. Why don't you try first? Okay? And the child tries and says, so it fails. You say, you know what? Um, why don't you try again? Let's, let's work on what is. What went wrong here? So instead of just swooping in to just straight away, ah, you don't know, man. This is what you did last time. I often think it about a three-point approach. First one, the child to be fully independent. Second, for the parent to come in to um, initiate some of this thinking of problem solving. What did you do last time that was helpful? You know, like what will help you better? What do you like? Okay, and the last point then the parents come. So a bit of a, again, a bit of a traffic light approach. Okay. But of course, sometimes um, some things don't go well. Despite doing everything, parents doing everything, teachers doing everything, child doing everything, things still don't go well. Emotionally, academically, socially. What this tells me is sometimes this means that the issues that the child face are maybe a bit more than they can deal with. I said before, right? Stress is a response. They feel very stressed. You sort of see like this, like the stress signs I shared earlier for two weeks or even more. In fact, you feel getting worse. Now I'm not going to school at all, crying, nightmares every night. I think it's always for us to, good for our parents to now take one step further to see a professional to address this concerns. By professionals, I don't always mean like, say for example, clinical psychologists like myself, we start out maybe in, a, in terms of um, proximal development, school teachers, family, um, siblings, then maybe school counsellors, extending further hours to family service centres, doctors in polyclinics, and even for example, mental health professionals like myself. Okay, I suppose in this case, we all have different sets of skills. So once again, teaching a child that there are ways to address a problem in an organised fashion. So we don't need to be too kanjong and to just like do everything at the same time. Then the child feels, wow, the problem is so big. Uh. More like, hey, um, step by step, let's approach it together. All right? Because sometimes, imagine a child has, say, um, say dyslexia. It's a learning disability. Um, the child cannot read. The child can speak very well, but reading from print is a big problem. This may affect a child a lot in terms of language development. And often in this age group, children don't understand what is dyslexia. They don't even know what is, I cannot read. What's that's all they have in their young lives. What they will think is that I don't like to read. In fact, in my clinic, when I do assessments for, for dyslexia or other, other forms of um, learning disabilities, um, often the parents and the child always tell me, I don't like to read Chinese. I don't like to do this. But when I actually do assessment, I said, well, you don't like because you cannot. Or you struggle a lot. You struggle a lot more than your friends. They're like, really? I didn't know that. I thought everyone can do it. I just cannot. So can you, can you understand how uh, dyslexia or any form of a professional level difficulty. The child's self-talk be quite different despite parent teaching them things like you can do it, try a bit harder, what you do before they helped you, right? So again, I think having an assessment will be a lot clearer for parents and also for teachers and for um, students. I think MOE does do these assessments but must see that because their systems are so clogged. Sorry that MOE teachers here as parents as well, or even psychologists here, but I know that it takes like, um, it takes nine months to a year. Okay, to get some of these assessments done in the MOE. So I will say that that's, that's also one of the reasons why I think, um, at least for me, like, I, I in biopractice, this, I, I did this because I can respond faster. Like I said, I don't want the child to go through this for too long. I like to keep the stress around four to six, not around eight to 10. That's when assessments help the child to understand, of course, the assessments are also meant to identify the problem and to lead the child towards, once again, resources to help them in a way that they should be helped. Not just, oh, you have dyslexia, so uh, good luck to you. That's not the idea. It's more to go towards specialist support so they can also get help. And what's last, of course, counselling. That's why I discussed about chronic stress. So some parents, some families have difficulties financially, emotionally, socially, and it's really difficult. And this stress can also seep through the cracks and go on to the child. For some of our families going through divorce issues, right? These are, these are definitely issues that the child cannot deal with. Even if they say, I understand that they, I would say even teenagers cannot understand so well because it's something that is really out of their control. This is where counseling can help with the child and also the family. Okay? 
So of course, this is where I expose uh, um, this is where I come in, right? Um, so I of course, my thing is uh, mind care therapy suites. So we're located at Farrah Park Medical Center. So the phone number, and of course, over there we have psychologists of different ranges, seeing children with like anxiety, OCD, anger management issues, to assessments, and also to parents, relationship problems, and so on and so forth. But I say I view all this in terms of a family systems unit. So if families or parents are distressed or depressed or very upset with work setting, you also go to the child. Okay, and that's where the child may learn some negative self-talk. All right. So I think uh, with this kind of comes to the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Gifford. Okay, so we are moving on to the QA session right now. So for parents who have any questions, you guys can type it into the QA chat at the bottom of your control panel. I see we have a question here uh, from Jasmine. Uh, for Gifford, can you help us with this? My kids don't really share what is troubling them. What can I do? Mm, okay, I, this is a good question. Thanks so much for this question. I, I think that, um, first of all, many kids, like you said, at this age, they may not even know what exactly is distressing them. So I suppose that's where we, we try to ask some open-ended questions, if possible, and also to ask, like, parents to be a CSI, la, you know, to really ask a bit about um, whether siblings know or whether teachers may know, or even for the school counselor to be involved to get some information from the child sometimes. Often, even as a mental health professional, I don't interrogate the child because that way, the support or the counselling becomes very scary, like a policeman, you know? So definitely, definitely I ask the child to really um, uh, give them space to do that. Sometimes parents also do engage um, psychologists like myself to really help with some of these issues because some children are scared of parental reactions when they share this problem. I think that's very, um, very real, right? Because you say, for example, mommy teaching me before, no, I'm still struggling with it. I feel very, I feel very paise. I feel very bad. I feel very stupid asking mommy. Because mommy will tell me the same thing. So sometimes having a different approach will be helpful. And again, I realize that it doesn't always have to be a psychologist, you know. It can be a teacher, it can be a school counselor. And of course, if you need help, again, a psychologist will be helpful. All right. Thanks so much for, so much, thanks so much for the question. Thank you, Gifford. We have also another question uh, ask, from a parent asking, how would I know if my child requires professional help or counselling mm. at the same time? Okay. Um, I think this question is um, really good. I think I touched on, on, on it a little bit as well. So mm. I will say that um, when a child uh, has the distress signs as I shared with earlier, right? Let me go back to the previous slide. It's not so much here, but I think I should start on distress where the routines are changed, a mood is a lot more moody, um, a lot of physical like headaches and stomach aches and cannot sleep, things like that, right? We persist for about a period of two weeks. I would say let's do a bit of investigation already. All right, so I won't wait too long, about two weeks. Because like some children they go through tough days, some days are just tougher, some seasons are just tougher. But I would say if it's for a period of two weeks, it's good to always check in with teachers already to hear what can be done. Some schools have different resources. For some of it's a friendship problem, um, some school counselors do engage kids to come together to really talk it out, even to share in a safe setting on some of these issues. Um, some schools don't do that. Again, I think now in COVID times, things have really changed quite a bit. Um, so some um, parents also do engage, I say, uh, counseling. So after about a period of two, you say, why don't you speak to someone, an uncle? Because often you say a doctor, a kid gets very scared. Uh, is it injection? Is it medicine? Like, so bad, uh, you know, I'm just like, I just feel lousy. Like, again, whereas at this age, they are too young to really understand all these very, very um, distressing things. All right. So more to say, well, uh, I have an uncle friend who can help, or an auntie friend who can help to um, um, talk to you and teach you some skills. So I always really use this growth perspective to say, to teach you some skills. All right. So they feel like, oh, okay, a bit like a tuition class, is it? A bit like enrichment, which I think children in Singapore are a lot more used to than a doctor or a professional, you know, that kind of thing. Is that right? So I can't give you so, so um, direct advice because I think I've not seen a child, but I think these questions are really good. Thank you, Gifford. Okay, uh, I think we'll be taking the last question for today. Uh, another parent is asking, my son loses focus easily. What can I do to help him to better focus? Mm, okay, okay. I think it's a, I think a very common question. And often I realize that this question always comes with son. Very, more rare with daughters. Uh. So I'll say that, um, first of all, um, 
First of all, um, to help the son better focus, it's always good to do work in two ways. So I, you see my mind, I like that boxes in my head. Uh, the first one is to remove distractions. The second one is to help them to um, focus better. Okay. So to remove distractions would mean that if possible, to study in a room without other distractions. If it's a phone or something like that, please put it outside. Um, on a table, what I like, I'm very old school. I just one pencil, one pen, and one eraser. You don't need all the extra, extra stuff. Okay, like the ruler, the color pencils, the crayons on it. We don't really need so much of that. Okay? Especially, so of course, it depends on what's the topic at hand. So I keep it very, very basic. Okay? So that way they are less distracted. I also often ask for a, a more um, regular timing for parents to do this with them, especially when they're studying. Why? Because so, so that way they know, and over time, they learn a structure. So it's not like, oh, yo, now I must do homework. I cannot play. As opposed to, actually this half an hour every night, I'll be doing some homework or discussion with mommy and daddy. So it's like fixed your day. Lah. So it's what I bring out, you know, it will, I will not be playing at all. That kind of thing. So once this routine is set in, it's a lot easier for parents to get the child to be less distracted. Okay, to make the child more attentive, I will say usually I keep the, the learning a bit um, shorter and bite-sized. Okay, so often I'll be, um, some children work better with supervision. That means parents have to be there beside them. I will like it if parents don't, um, on the phone too much la, during the when the child is studying use the phone it's really very distracting you know because like um, the child will feel a bit like it's not role model ma, right I see you having fun then I'm struggling here you know where's the, where's the, where's the support that I, I hope to have so often I'll ask parents you don't mind for about half an hour you know like uh, maybe um, revise a bit the child hear the child's view as well and often at the end of that I give a small reward and a small celebration even for myself even my own son okay I'll give like um, gummies some people say, wow, gummy is bad for teeth. I say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, not too much gummies, but the fact is that um, some reinforcement to show that, hey, you have got a small reward. Okay? But this, again, reinforces in the child that, hey, um, when I do this, I persist for a while, I pay attention, mommy, daddy likes it, and there's a small celebration for that. Okay? I also add that, if possible, in terms of the, um, in terms of the material that is going through, um, some children lose attention very quickly. So, I will switch between subjects quite quickly as well. So instead of doing, for example, maths for like 30 to 45 minutes straight, maybe do 20 minutes maths and 30 minutes English to switch it up. So that again, the attentional profile goes up. Of course, some children may have ADHD. I'll say ADHD is about almost 10% um, of the population. So it costs about 40, 4. And that's quite a big number. These are all the reported stats. We haven't talked about the unreported stats. So once again, I think uh, if you feel it's a concern, it's always nice to just check in a professional, but to see if um, there's any concern for that as well. Once again, I'll add uh, that um, having attention problems or ADHD doesn't mean that you must be failing in class. Then I have ADHD. That was a very, um, very 1990s way of looking at things. Now, that people who can do well in school doesn't mean they don't struggle with the attention wise. Okay? Thanks so much, Rachel. Next questions. Hey, thank you so much, Gifford, for sharing your advice and answering our questions. So I'm sure you all have all learned something new today. All right, so we hope to bring more of these webinars to you guys in the future. All right, thank you all for joining us today and we wish you all a nice evening.